participation. J'aimerais remercier et féliciter uh, much, uh, les trois rapporteurs uh, pour leur contribution intéressante et constructive lors de l'étude du conflit en République tchétchène. J'ai lu plus particulièrement le rapport de Lord George Judd et participé aux travaux de la Commission politique. Je constate qu'il a présenté la situation telle qu'il l'a vue et ressenti sur le terrain, pas à la télévision, mais sur place. Comme il nous l'a dit, nous nous devons d'être francs et d'être directs. Malheureusement, l'on se doit de constater que très peu de progrès ont été accomplis visant à garantir la pleine jouissance des droits humains et de la primauté du droit à l'ensemble de la population. Nous reconnaissons qu'en vertu de la théorie des petits pas, il y a des efforts, mais il y a de lourdes violations aux droits de la personne. Pour ce, qu y a, pour ce qui est de la résolution pacifique de ce conflit, les divers intervenants politiques savent ce qui doit être fait. Ces intervenants politiques sont très au courant qu'au préalable, et ce, avant toute discussion, les combats armés doivent cesser. Par la suite, un véritable processus de paix pourra être initié. Nous saluons le début du processus de négociation pour bientôt. Toutefois, l'aspect humanitaire de ce conflit devrait pour nous, parlementaires, être la toute première priorité. On parle ici d'enfants, de femmes, de vieillards qui souffrent et sont terrorisés. On parle ici de manque de médicaments, de détournement d'aide internationale, de corruption. On ne parle pas ici des extrémistes qui ne veulent rien savoir d'un règlement pacifique de ce conflit. Au contraire, ils s'alimentent et s'abreuvent de la violence. Pour orienter les discussions futures du Conseil de l'Europe, l'Assemblée devrait considérer un rapport récent de janvier 2002 qui émane de représentants de la société civile russe, dont Mme Elena Bonner, présidente de la Fondation Sakharov. Cette table ronde, qui se nomme « Action commune », demande à l'Assemblée parlementaire du Conseil de l'Europe de demander à la Fédération russe de s'assurer du respect des droits humains et du droit humanitaire en Tchétchénie, d'enquêter les crimes commis contre la population civile et de punir les coupables, et finalement d'encourager une résolution politique de ce conflit par le début de négociations avec M. Aslam Maskadov. En conclusion, les événements du 11 septembre ne doivent pas être une raison pour poursuivre des violations aux droits de la personne sous prétexte de traquer des terroristes. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Merci, Monsieur. Maintenant, à la liste et à la présence de ceux qui étaient là à l'appel de leur nom, ne retenant pas pas par conséquent ce qui était absent et qui sont venus We après. Je donne la parole au dernier intervenant, M. Zagayev-Bouchy. Je voudrais donner la parole au dernier intervenant, M. Zagayev-Bouchy. Je voudrais donner la parole au dernier intervenant, M. Zagayev. M. Zagayev, Zagayev. Il n'est pas là. Est-ce qu'il n'est pas présent? Le micro, s'il vous plaît. Can we have a microphone for the speaker, please? Уважаемые председатели, уважаемые коллеги, прежде всего, мне как представитель Чеченской Республики хотелось бы выразить искреннюю благодарность от имени многонационального чеченского народа парламентской ассамблеи Европы за ту большую работу, которую проводят представители ПАСИ, Лорд Джад, Кадуаш, Ивинский и Дмитрий Рогозин, и их коллеги, а также правозащитник Владимир Коломанов. Прошло ровно год со дня принятия известного резолюции ПАСИ 1240. За этот период в республике проделана большая работа, выработан проект Конституции Республики. Республику вернулось более двух тысяч жителей, которые покинули республику в предыдущих годах. Сегодня в республике функционирует 53 больницы. За, за школьной партии сели более 192 тысяч учеников. В высших и средних учебных заведениях у нас 
Сегодня учатся более 18 тысяч студентов. То есть проводится большая позитивная работа по стабилизации социальной разведки напряженности в республике. Но вместе с тем, уважаемые коллеги, мы должны понимать, и другое, не дав всестороннюю объективную оценку событий десятилетнего периода, труда Масхатовского периода, мы не сумеем создать условия для установления прочного мира согласия на этой многострадальной земле. В течение 10 лет этого правления республику покинуло более 700 тысяч населения. Уважаемый правозащитник Ковалев как-то... В это время или ослеп оглох, что-то не замечали наши вот сегодня вот те правозащитники, которые стоят за спиной, я бы сказал, сказал бы, этих террористов и бандитов. Если мы уберем внешнюю привлекательность лозунгов, выдвигаемых этим режимом, независимость, построение светского государства, то увидим набор изощренных преступлений. Это похищение людей, убийство заложников, наркобизнес, налеты на населенные пункты как внутри республики, так и за пределами ее, в соседней республики. Лещенные разума и дары руководить созидательным процессом, они путем провокации и интриг создали обстановку национальной разобщенности и вражды. К чему это привело Чеченский республик? Всем известно. К сожалению, не все еще осознали, какой трагедии, трагедии оборачивает слепая вера подобным выразительным интересам народа. Носители террористической угрозы, совершающие преступные действия, приводящие к массовой гибели ни в чем не повинных людей, не имеют ни национальности, ни вероисповедования. О том, что сегодня Масхаду и его окружение хотят мира, говорят убийства видных духовных и авторитетных чеченцев, вызывающих согласие. Присутствие наемников и международных террористов банд формирования, а также совершение изощренных преступлений против чеченства, чеченцев главарями этих банд, не дает возможность Масхаду и его окружению сложить оружие, является основными причинами, не позволяющими рассматривать политическое урегулирование в качестве альтернативы контртеррористической операции, в принципе, исключающей необходимость последней. Сегодня очевидно, что проблема политического урегулирования Чеченской Республики выдвинулась на первый план. Свидетельством тому стала миротворческая инициатива президента России Владимира Путина, обратившегося с призывом к участникам незаконного вооруженного формирования, взявшим в руки оружие под влиянием ложно искаженных ценностей, выйти на представителей власти для обсуждения порядка их разоружения и включения в мирную жизнь. Переговоры ведутся с представителями незаконных вооруженных формирования на всех уровнях. При этом мировое сообщество должно понять, что речь не идет о реанимации бандитского режима Масхадова, связанного с международным терроризмом, направленной на, а на возвращение мирной жизни обманутых людей. Уважаемые товарищи, взрывы жилых домов в Москве в Волгодонске, других городах России, в международном торговом центре Нью-Йорка, унесших тысяч жизней, является звеньем одной цепи международного терроризма. Недооценка опасных событий, происходящих в Чечне, Афганистане и других регионах мировым сообществом, отсутствие своевременной совместной борьбы с этим злом, позволило международному терроризму укорониться стать на ноги и распространиться на всех континентах мира. Я бы вот...
and the votes on the draft resolution and the draft recommendation and amendments will take this afternoon at about 4.45. It's now near to 12 noon. Does any member still wish to vote in the election of a member of the European Court of Human Rights on behalf of Georgia? You can do it for two minutes, and then the ballot for electing a member of the European Court of Human Rights is closed. The counting of votes will take place under the supervision of the tellers, and I will invite them to go after 12 o'clock uh, at the end of the sitting. Yeah, they, they count at the end of the sitting. I invite them to go then to room 1087. The results of the election will be announced at the beginning of the next sitting. Dear friends and colleagues, we now have the honor of hearing a statement by Mr. Shimon Peres, Foreign Minister of Israel. After his statement, Mr. Peres has kindly agreed to take questions from the floor. Mr. Peres, we are very happy to have you here. A welcome to you, and you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Peter Schrider. I would like to congratulate you on becoming the president of this very prestigious and important chamber. I would like also to thank Mr. Russell Johnson for extending the invitation to come and speak. Ladies and gentlemen, we left yesterday evening from Jerusalem, a very sad city where many families faced again <clears throat> the horror of terror, the loss of their beloved one. And again, we can see the heavy clouds over the skies of Jerusalem and Israel. It is not our wish, and neither are we ready to accept it as a norm of our life or as a convention of the relations between the Palestinians and ourselves. Basically, we would like really to see a peaceful relations between the Palestinian people and the Arab countries and Israel. We are not in search of war, we are not in search of victories, and we know deep in our hearts that good neighbors are better than good guns. Actually, we made peace with two countries. We left the territory of a third country, and we offered a peaceful agreement with the fourth country, actually without error. We gave back to the Egyptians all the land, all the water, all the oil, without any Ben Laden and without any terroristic imposition. We gave back to Jordan all the land, all the water, again without any coercion by guns or bombs. As a matter of fact, we did it after we won a war, not after we lost the war. When it comes to the Palestinians, I know people say, bring an end to the occupation. Give them back <coughs> the land and make peace. Actually, we try to do it too. In Camp David, our former Prime Minister, Barack, with the support of President Clinton, has offered the Palestinians to get back, not all of the land, but maybe 96, 97 percent of the land. And they could have negotiated the other two or three. It's very hard for Israel and for the Israelis to understand why did the Palestinians reject it? What went wrong? I'm sure that if in the case of Jordan and Egypt, terror was ne not necessary, in the case of the Palestinians, it is terror that has prevented the agreement. 
and terrorists preventing the agreement to this very day. I want to speak as objectively as I can. I'm asking myself, why is there a rap terror? We have more than one answer, frankly speaking. Some people say, well, Arafat will never be satisfied unless he will have everything he wants to. And he was very close to have much of he wanted to. But Israel too has their own problems. It's not that we want to give everything or don't want. We need also security for our people. We are two peoples living on a very small piece of land, integrated, living one on the side of the other, even one in the inside of the other. And we have to establish relations which will promise peace. The people who say that Arafat is not interested in, well, have to go and fight terror. But people who may think that Arafat is interested in making peace, why doesn't he make it? And that's the problem that a person like myself is asking himself. And my answer is that it is not because of his positions, but because of his composition. There is no chance that Arafat will be able to make peace, or we shall be able to make peace with him, unless he will do a basic thing which is necessary by all states and authorities. And that is to put a control over all armed forces, over all arms, over all people who use the arms. I'm afraid that as long as there will be three or four or five groups, each of them with a different agenda, each of them holding their own guns and their own bombs, and Arafat will have to make coalitions with them, not they will give up their arms, but they will hold their arms for a while. He will not be in charge. He will not be in control of his people. Some Palestinians, Arafat himself, told me, well, you too, in your cabinet, you have many views. That's right, we have many views. We have many views, but we have one gun. And the Palestinians have maybe one view, but they have many guns. Now, there is nothing wrong if the Palestinians will have many views. We don't say that they have to take the view of Arafat or anybody else. But as long as there are groups that are getting orders from Syria, from Iran, occasionally orders that has nothing to do with the Palestinian people, but the search of some clergymen in the Islam world to control all Arab countries, there won't be peace. And here we are coming to the main point. We are at a modern age, and there are many offerings. And one must ask himself, how come that so many countries that could have entered the promises of a new age and escape the, fa the failures, the flaws of the old age, why didn't they do it? Ladies and gentlemen, may I say that the old uh, excuses and explanation that they didn't do it because there are still imperial forces or, colonialist, or col colonial intentions, that this is the sort of backward and poverty, this disappeared. It, it's no longer true. There are, I don't know any country today that has an imperialistic appetite or a colonialistic intention. I'm sure that if uh, Israeli would come today to Queen Victoria and offer her some countries uh, like uh, Burma or Afghanistan, I'm not so sure that you would be attracted again. It's over. And the answer goes to basic values. You cannot have the potential of high technologies unless you adopt real freedom and real decency. You cannot have a science-based economy because science cannot go with lies. Science cannot go, go with dictatorship. You cannot lie scientifically. 
science and technology calls for the pursuit of truth uninterruptedly, without any compromises. You cannot have investment unless you have transparency in your books. You cannot have free research unless you have a free society. You cannot have a modern economy unless your skies and gates are open for commerce and honest exchange. And strangely enough, the 11th of September showed that most of the world has entered already the new age. Today there is an unwritten coalition of the United Europe, United States, Russia, China, India, Pakistan, Japan, many of the Latin American countries, many of the African countries. And not that all of them fall in love with America, but because all of them understand there must be a basic situation that will permit a new generation to enjoy the offers of a new age. And then on the 11th of September, we saw again the other side of the moon, the dark side of the moon. Terror can exist only in countries where there is a dictatorship, where murder and lies are permitted, where we can kill and cheat and cover and deny. And it is, again, the second part of it, showing that modern age with modern economy cannot coexist with high-tech terror. None of you can agree that we should live in an age where to enter a plane will be a danger, where to build a skyscraper will be a risky proposition, where eventually using chemical and biological weapons will mean that there is a danger to the fresh air and fresh water. And there is a choice. Arafat said that he is with the world that is fighting terror. To fight terror is not a promenade in a garden of roses. It's a tough job. When Israel was created, our Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion did it to the point that he ordered to shoot at a ship that brought arms to our people and killed 20 of the Israeli citizens. Because if Arafat will not stop the terror, in fact, the terror will stop him eventually. And for that reason, the first thing, I believe, that what we demand from Arafat, and by the way, we don't pretend to elect the Palestinian leaders. They have to elect it. We cannot elect them. We cannot fire them. We don't intend to do so. But what we demand is that the leader <coughs> will be a leader. And the world will be a world because you can run a government either by words or by guns. By guns, it's a chaotic situation. By words, every country has a non-democratic organization, namely an arm, an army. Army is not democratic in order to defend democracy. And if Arafat will not do it, if the Palestinians will not do it, What can we do? We have to stop the terrorists. And the terrorists today are having among them the suicide bombers. And once a suicide bomber is on his way, we cannot stop him. The only way for us is to prevent his entry to the country. And then I know it's uh, very unpleasant again. But the choice is from time to time to save the lives of tens of young people, uh, women, innocent people, elderly, or to let him in, and then it will be too late. We want to make peace with the Palestinians, to recognize their rights, to recognize their right to live independently, in fairness, in prosperity. They are not our enemies. Our enemies are neither a religion nor a state. Our enemies is what is your enemies? Terror. Because we are, went over 
from a world that has had enemies and armies, which were basically national, to a world that is having dangers, which are basically global. Today, you're in an absurd situation where you have armies without enemies and you have dangers without armies. You don't have ways to defend your own land, your own people, either against narcotics or against terror, and they can become more and more developed, use more and more technological matters or pollution. Since we became global, we became global for good and for bad. For good is really to have the advantages of new technologies and new sciences, and also for bad, we have to stand the dangers which are emerging from this very deep change. I want to tell distinguished members of the Parliament of the European Council the following things. What we would like your distinguished chamber to do is to work out together with the United States, Russia, a policy that is not against the Palestinians. We didn't come to ask you to be one-sided. Not against their rights and futures, but to save them from their own <coughs> agonies, their own mistake, to bring an end to terror. I believe that a joint position by the United States, United Europe, Russia, and other countries is extremely efficient to help the Palestinians to escape the chaotic situation, the divided forces, and say, OK, let's negotiate. And then I can tell you on behalf of the State of Israel, the minute terror will be stopped, or the terroristic groups will be outlawed outlaw, we should go straight ahead to negotiations. And I can even add that maybe the territorial distances between the Palestinians and us are smaller than the emotional gap between our people. Today the problem is the two people don't trust each other. We are very angry with the Palestinians because they have rejected the proposals at Camp David and they went again to terror. They are very angry with us because they live, I must admit, under a very demanding economic situation, which we would like to see. We don't want to punish any Palestinian. We don't want to see them suffering. It is imposed upon us, and we would like to, to do immediately whatever we can to facilitate life, to make them a happier and a freer people. And we shall go to negotiate. It's not a negotiation without hope. We were very close to have peace. And then again, we would like that the voice will go around to the Arab countries, some of them with whom we made peace and we gave back everything to make peace, that they too will take a clear stand for peace. As there is a camp of peace in Israel, we would like to see camps of peace in the surrounding countries, if not for the sake of Israel, for their own sake. Nobody can save countries from backwardness and poverty but themselves. There is nobody that prevents any country to enter the age of modern economy and open market and free relations. And there is no justification that single-handed groups will keep countries in poverty and backwardness. And what keeps them there is basically corrupted governments, occasionally with a religious justification, with a religious clock, and they are the suffering. We learned that uh, your parliament is uh, proposing a law that will guarantee the rights of the minorities. We would like to join in. We have also an important Arab minority in Israel. We would like to guarantee their minority to join in a new proposal. 
But maybe you need also a guarantee for the majorities. Because in many countries, the majorities don't have the right of representation in their own countries. I believe that the whole world has entered a struggle which is not like the former one. It's not between East and West ideologically. It's not like between North and South economically. It's between free countries and terrorized countries. Terror begins with terrorizing their own people, with discrimination of majorities, discrimination of women, discrimination of minorities. <coughs> people are asking, can Arafat do it? My judgment is nobody can answer it unless he will try. My estimate is if he will try, he may succeed. If he won't do it, there is no future for a real peace process, and needless to say, for a prosperous Palestinian people. I want to say again that we appreciate your interest, your attitude. We marched through 53 years of independence, on many occasions alone, on many occasions in face of great dangers where we were outnumbered, outgunned. Many people even didn't think that we can make it. And uh, Israel is basically a history of its people, but I do not see why other countries cannot do likewise, including the Palestinians. They too can make their own road. They have an intelligent people. And I'm sure that peace can win. It is not with an easy heart that I came here. And I know that uh, there are different views about it. But basically, we're in the same camp of freedom, of peace, of tolerance, of hope. The young generation, Arab or Jewish or Christian, don't have to repeat all the mistakes and all the agonies that were done before. We have a choice for a new future. And we shall appreciate very much your willing contribution to introduce such a future in the Middle East. Thank you very much. from this Thank you very much, Mr. Perez, for your most interesting statement. Members of the Assembly have expressed a wish to put questions to you and the Vice Prime Minister and Foreign Minister was kindly enough to say yes to these questions. A substantial number of colleagues have indicated a wish to do so. In order to ensure that as many as possible are able to put their questions, I do not propose to allow supplementary questions. The first question is by Mr. Terry Davis, the leader of the Socialist Group. Please. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, may, I, uh, may I congratulate you, Mr. Perez, on your statement today. We have listened to it with great interest. But can you tell us what proposals exist for a meeting between yourself and Mr. Arafat or someone representing him? Please, Mr. Perez. We are meeting all the time constantly with Palestinian leaders. We are meeting on two levels. One is the security level representatives of the Palestinians and ourselves in order to see what can be done to reduce uh, violence and dangers. 
and I personally am meeting with Palestinian leaders to see how to do it politically. Our position is that we cannot negotiate under fire. I myself may feel that maybe there is room to negotiate under fire as well. But you know, you start to negotiate, and then a terrorist comes to Jerusalem and starts shooting around it, the whole negotiation fall immediately, fall. Now we are trying to talk politically also how to achieve a ceasefire, because there are political elements, like for example, how to facilitate the conditions in the territories. And occasionally we see it on every blockage and on every passage to see how to make life easier. So we talk with the Palestinians, both on the military side and the political side, in order to achieve a ceasefire. Thank you very much. Next one is Mr. Van der Linden, the leader of the PPA group. And he has 30 seconds as all the others. Please. Thank you very, <coughs> thank you very much. Uh, may I uh, thank Mr. Perez for his impressive speech and also for the peaceful uh, 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 efforts in his country. I want to put forward one question, and there is, uh, in your countries, there are different opinions on how you have to tackle the, uh, uh, the revenge uh, uh, from both sides. Why don't you uh, take one moment uh, without any revenge from your side to show also the world that uh, only without revenge you can come to a peaceful solution? Mr. Beres, please. I think we have declared the unilateral ceasefire that lasted for a week, and then it fell down. But, you know, our real problem, and I know that uh, many people criticize us for it, is how to handle the issue of suicide bombers. This, this is the greatest problem we are facing. Because if you got a piece of information that there is a suicide bomber on his way, how can you stop him? The minute he enters the country, he will not be stopped by the police or by the military. He will explode himself. In, in face of them. Our only chance to save life is really to intercept him before he enters the country. And again, the problem, Israel would gladly do it one-sidedly, as you have indicated, but if Arafat cannot control all the groups, it's in vain, in vain. And uh, that's why I was so much emphasizing the need for the Palestinian Authority to become an authority, to control the guns and shooting. Thank you. The next one is Mr. Urshi, the leader of the Liberal Group. Mr. Perez, I, I join my colleagues in, in wishing you the best luck in achieving your goals, durable peace in the Middle East. In your speech, you spoke a lot about the terrorists, but you didn't say too much about Israeli responses, and my, uh, from the international media, we see the reaction from Prime Minister Sharon, and you disagreeing with his actions. And my question to you is, that do you think that while you can give us very convincing speeches here, do you have enough, conf enough influence in the Israeli government to implement your goals and to have a real united policies vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians? Please. I shall answer your question very honestly. I, as a member of Labour, represent a party that has lost the elections. <laughs> Mr. Sharon represents a party that won the elections. And he represents today a majority as a prime minister. Now, why did we lose the elections? Basically, because after the proposals that we have introduced by a Labour prime minister were rejected, we lost our support in the eyes of many Israelis. They say, you are very nice people. You want to have peace, but you don't have a partner. Look at your partner. He rejected your proposals. He started to shoot around. So we became a minority. And I don't pretend that I'm a majority. As a minority, I have to ask myself where to be, in the parliament as an opposition, or in a coalition government that are conditioned to join in well, that we are not going to divorce our standings, and we are not going to silence 
our voice. And we have introduced four conditions in order to build a coalition government. The four were A, not to build new settlements, B, to thrive to a permanent solution with the Palestinians and the Syrians based on 242 and 338. That was never the position of the rightest parties in Israel, neither the settlements nor this. Three, that uh, we are ready to make painful compromises. And four, that we are going to respect all the signed agreements, including by the Labour government, including Oslo agreement, provided the Palestinians will do likewise. You know, it's a difficult choice. You can criticize me on it. But as a man who thinks that maybe in this year, next year, decisions will be taken, I thought it's right for us as a minority group, not in the parliament, but in the prime ministership elections, to try and insist on those four basic conditions which carries the hope for peace. And that is what's happening. Thank you. The next one is Mr. Atkinson, the leader of the GDE. Prime Minister, we very much appreciate your presence here today. Do you agree that for there to be any chance of a settlement in the Middle East conflict, which is the principal cause of international terrorism today, it requires the Palestinians to accept that there can be no realistic right of return for most of the refugees and Israel to abandon its policy of settlements in the territories it occupies? You know, there were in the Middle East 24 states. 22 were Muslims, one was Christian, one is Jewish. What is a Muslim or a Christian or a Jewish state? A state where the Muslims or the Christians or the Jews are a majority. The Christian state stopped to exist, Lebanon, because the Christians lost their majority. Don't expect us, the Jewish people, to lose the majority in our land and stop being a Jewish state. We suffered enough throughout history, including Europe, to justify our own independence. And the right of return, right or wrong, does not call for the suicide of the state of Israel. And by the way, we have also absorbed a million Jewish people who came from Arab land. The war has really changed the demographic picture. And even now, what we are saying is, we understand that in order to remain a Jewish state, we are ready to recognize a Palestinian state. This is not an official position of the government, but Sharon, myself, others said it. And we are for partition. Namely, we are ready to give up part of the land in order to keep the nature of our country. The right of return of the Palestinians means to change the demography of the country. And it which will mean the end of the state. What I'm telling you, I'm telling also the Palestinian leaders. And fortunately enough, there is at least one outstanding Palestinian, Sere Nusebe, who is a, a president of a university and he is supposed to be the representative of the Palestinians in Jerusalem who stood up and said clearly to the Palestinians, stop it, it doesn't make sense. And that was probably one of the failures in Camp David. So our position is very clear. We want to participate in solving the refugees by saving them from the status of refugees to help and participate financially and otherwise, even in the issue of the reunion of families, we are ready. But there is one thing we are not ready, and that is to bring an end to Israel as a Jewish state. Next one is Mr. Laxo, the leader of the United Left Group. We were quite surprised yesterday when I heard uh, with your party colleague, former Prime Minister of Israel, uh, he asked the United States to define Arafat as terrorist. I think we all here agree that this kind of statements doesn't help the peace process to come back to on the rail. What do you think about this kind of, of statements from the side of the former Prime Minister of Israel? 
please. As a former prime minister, I must be fair to former prime ministers, so I won't make any remarks. The next one is Mr. Behrendt from Germany. Uh, Minister, let me first uh, emphasize that I do understand that Israel has to react very strongly on uh, each uh, of the terrorist attacks uh, against its population. But let me ask you, nevertheless, uh, do you think it's according to the rule of law to commit um, preventive liquidations uh, against uh, Palestinian leaders and do you think it's adequate uh, to destroy the infrastructure as, for instance, of the airfield and the Gaza Strip, uh, which has been built by EU means uh, as a reaction to terrorism? The issue was checked by our judiciary in what you call the liquidation for prevention. And the answer was, if you have an enemy, either in a uniform or without uniform, that comes to kill your people, you have the right of self-defense. And I explained it carefully, that if we get information about a person who is having in his hands what we call a ticking bomb, that he can in a few minutes enter the country and bomb, and usually their targets is uh, youth clubs, <laughs> nightclubs, these sort of things, to kill young people. It is our full right to defend our lives. And we were very careful because we are law-abiding peop abiding people. We don't want to overdo it. Next one is Mr. Mota Amaral from Portugal. Thank you. Mr. Minister, do you accept my personal repudiation for the terrorist attacks against Israel, my solidarity for the horror they caused, and also my strong criticism for the retaliation Israel is conducting? My question, do you still consider valid the mutual propositions for peace? The answer is yes. This is the official position of our government. We have accepted the mutual proposition. And by the way, when people say that we have to offer a political horizon to the Palestinians, there is a political horizon in the mutual report. As there is a political horizon in the declaration of the government in the agreement of the present coalition to implement all the previous agreements. There is a great deal that Israel has to do and a great deal that the Palestinians have to do. But we have accepted fully the mutual proposals. As you know, the mutual proposals marks a sequence, an order of things. You have to have, first of all, a ceasefire, then confidence building measures, then negotiations for a political solution. And what we are now trying is to have the first step, namely a ceasefire, that will permit the train to leave the first station and move to the target of full negotiations. Thank you. Mr. Nekuta from Moldova. Monsieur Perez. Le dernier temps, l'État d'Israël a un comportement assez dur envers les Palestiniens. Depuis, les maisons sont observées d'autres processus négatifs, même à Rafat, contraints dans toutes ces actions. Pensez-vous qu'une telle politique dure peut mener à la situation du conflit et à son aggravation et extension Merci. Might solve the conflict instead of making it more severe. Thank you, sir. No, we didn't start with limiting the actions of Arafat. But you know, we have had over the last month or so the following events. One was an illegal ship was carrying illegal arms some of them extremely dangerous to the Palestinians, and apparently the Palestinian Authority was in the know. This was against the law, against the agreement. Then there were four Israeli soldiers killed. Then a week ago, uh, one, of the, one of the terrorists came in in a town in Israel, started shooting around in Hadera yesterday in Jerusalem. 
It is not only us, you know. We have had the American observer, the American uh, envoy, General Zini coming. He asked the Palestinians, why are you destroying all the credibility? Look, the United States today, and even Europe too, are posing the same question for Arafat. Arafat must establish his credibility. And that's the greatest problem. And obviously, Israel is trying to introduce some pressure upon him to do so too. Because we said we are not going to destroy the Palestinian Authority or to hit Mr. Arafat. But we want him to behave in accordance with his commitment. Thank you. Mr. Yanes Parnuevo from Spain is the next. Gracias, Presidente. Thank you, Mr. President. Eh, señor Pérez, me alegro, me alegro mucho que esté aquí like y le felicito por su presencia y por sus palabras. Creo que usted ha dicho eh, la verdad, pero seguramente reconocerá conmigo que es la mitad de la verdad. However, y nos hubiera gustado escuchar la verdad del señor Arafat, que no puede venir aquí porque está retenido en el ramado. Eh, y probablemente él nos hubiera dicho que alguna de las causas, además de las que usted ha dicho, es también eh, la visita del señor Sharon a la explanada de las mezquitas. Pero mi pregunta concreta, señor presidente, era cómo valora la mediación o la actitud o la diplomacia de la Unión Europea a través del embajador moratino en Oriente Próximo. Well, first of all, I understand you're having here tomorrow Mr. Saeed Barakat, who is fully authorized to present the Palestinian uh, case. And you didn't invite Sharon, you invited me too, so apparently you invited secondary people to come and present the case. Now, Arafat receives delegations from all over the world, including the European one. No problem. Nobody prevent him from speaking or expressing his views. But I must say, even if it's not necessarily my own views, that the suspicion about his motivations are so deep. You know, if you will sit in our cabinet and uh, you will be asked, for example, about handing over money to the Palestinians. There is an organization which is called Tanzim. They are now exercising most of the acts of terror. They are on the payroll of the Palestinians. And we are telling the Palestinians, either or, take them off your payroll or tell them to stop killing and shooting. You know, it's a very unique situation, very unique. When it comes to the European role, may I say, that we never suggested that Europe will act against the Palestinians, never. What we said is we did, didn't suggest that you will act against the uh, terror in Yugo uh, against the Yugoslavian people or against Afghanistan. What we are asking is to act against terror. And act, acting against terror will permit the renewal of the peace process. Today, I think uh, there is a very great and uh, positive coordination between the European position, the American position, because I believe that for Mr. Arafat himself, the international legitimacy is of great importance. And better to use political pressure than to use arms. And Arafat started really to respond to the American and the European pressure. He started to act against terror. But alas, he stopped at the wrong point, namely to dismantle all the other organizations who, in my judgment, are his real enemies. It's not Israel which makes his position impossible. It's the Hamas and the Jihad and the Hezbollah who are now again preparing attacks against Israel while I'm speaking here. And by the way, Hezbollah too doesn't represent Lebanon. They get orders from Iran, and they endanger Lebanon. As the Jihad and the Hamas are also getting orders from abroad, 
and they're endangering Arafat. The enemy of the Palestinians are those minority groups who are armed. And today I can only say the, and we told the, our European friends and the European Union, your economic aid to the Palestinian is welcome. On the contrary, we shall support everything that is positive, creating jobs, creating employment, yes. We don't consider ourselves enemies of the Palestinians. Now, this policy must bear fruits, not only for the sake of Israel, but in my judgment, for the sake of the Palestinians too. And I would highly and that you will keep the coordination between, uh, between the United States, Europe, Russia, because other, otherwise what will happen? A division between you will encourage a division in the Middle East. Every client will try to mobilize one side or another side. When it comes to terror, I feel today there is a well-accepted position to get rid of terrorism, not to get rid of nations, not to get rid of religions. And this must be continued in the most responsible manner. Thank you, Mr. Coulet from France. Monsieur le Président, Mr. President, I'd like to ask the Minister how he can reconcile and justify the observer status which Israel enjoys in the Council of Europe and its concern to respect democratic principles and rights, of, uh, human, human rights, when we know that Mr. Arafat, democratically elected uh, with the, within the Palestinian Authority, is prevented from exercising his functions. can be useful if there is an agreement. Then they have to observe an agreement. But when you don't have an agreement, what are they going to observe? You have, by the way, there is a group of European observers who can move freely. And I think you have heard their opinions, which are not far from my own. They tell you the same thing. And what can you do about it? Now, let me say, the problem of observers, seriously speaking, is that this is a confrontation between a legal army that acts openly, that you can photograph, televise, and a clandestine organization that you cannot see. What will the observers tell you that you don't know? They will never be permitted to visit the headquarters of Hamas or the Jihad or to comp accompany a terrorist. So it will be an one-sided sort of observation, as it is very much in television today. You have a problem when the legal army, and I know that uh, my, our friends from Spain and our friends from England and our friends from even France know it, when you have a confrontation between a clandestine organization and a legal and open army, observers can help very little. Next one is Mr. Magilov from Russia. Mr. Paris, uh, how do you evaluate the uh, possibility of a dialogue between uh, Palestinian National Assembly and Israeli Knesset? And can such a dialogue become a new docking mechanism between two nations? Thank you. Yeah. We have nothing against it. We don't prevent a dialogue on all levels. Uh, our president of uh, the parliament was invited, apparently, to speak before the National Assembly of the Palestinians, I said, why not I myself address this assembly? But the problem, unfortunately, is not in the hand of the assembly, of the parliamentarians, but really in the hands of the leaders. And the leaders, it's not just to take a position. I understand that they have to take a risk. And without taking a risk, they won't be leaders. You cannot be a leader just rhetorically. You have to defend your people. And I think the Palestinian leaders have to defend their people from their own terrorists, which are undermining their position. 
because Arafat uh, tells them to do and not to do, they wouldn't listen to him. And they compromise him more than us. Cute. The next is Mr. Weiss from Slovakia. Do you think uh, that uh, recent Israelis government uh, is uh, consequently on the position of the fulfillment of the United Nations Security Council Resolution 242? When will your government definitely stop and revise the policy of the building the settlements on the Palestinian territories? Thank you. Two and 338 has nothing to do with the settlements. We ourselves decided not to build more settlements. But you know, to be fair, may I say that the rightist government, headed by uh, Mr. Begin and with the participation of Mr. Sharon, fulfilled totally the 242 and 338 resolution concerning Egypt and even dismantled existing settlements. So experience shows that, as my own mentor Yohan said, that all experts are experts for what has happened. There is no expert for what may happen. And I think that if terror will stop, you may be surprised. <coughs> I mean, without complimenting neither the right or the left, can I say both right and left can from time to time produce exceptions, even miracles. Thank you. Next one is Mr. Daly from Ireland. Mr. President, Ireland is a member of the UN Security Council and the European Union with the experience learned from our own peace process has constantly sought to play an active role in supporting efforts to bring about a comprehensive and lasting settlement in the Middle East. In particular, we would like to see action taken by both sides towards implementing the Mitchell recommendation and the Tenor Plan. First step would be to recommend security cooperation between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. However, the seven-day period of absolute calm demanded by the government of Israel does not appear to be realistically obtainable. Uh, and in fact, it may be an obstacle. And I would welcome an assessment on the implementation of these initiatives given the deterioration of the situation. Please. I, I'm not sure I, I got your Ireland. question. Excuse me, Ireland. please. Ireland. I, I didn't understand the question. Just the one sentence. The, the, the tenet and the um, mutual recommendations giving the deterioration and the situation is the seven day absolute camp been demanded unrealistic now. I wouldn't be so quick to judge, and anyway, I wouldn't abandon it if we don't have a better alternative. And for the time being, the Tenet document and the Mitchell document are the two documents that were accepted both by the Palestinians and the Israelis, as in a matter of fact, by the rest of the world. So I wouldn't bring an end to it without having a better alternative and try very hard to make it into a reality. Thank you, Mr. Winski, Poland. Prime Minister, it's always a great pleasure to listen to you since you seem to be a realistic visioner or even a philosopher rather than the typical politicians. Uh, let me raise the issue of a linkage between the world terrorism and the situation in the Middle East. Do you think it's possible to combat effectively the international terrorism without reaching earlier the durable, peaceful solution of this dramatic conflict in the Middle East? I said it already, I think it's easier to find a solution without terror. I think terror is preventing a solution. Look, I, I'm, like everybody, I'm listening to what Ben Laden is saying. He wants to get rid of the Crusaders, for example. Crusaders are not necessarily Jewish people, as you know. It has nothing to do with the state of Israel. The idea of the terrorist is to have a hegemony of a religion over the states. And those are self-appointed leaders. Nobody has elected them. They are responsible to nobody. They hang on their guns, not on their values. They are not accountable to a, to a land, to a state, to a court, 
to a cause. And they can drive you crazy. And they have terrorists for different reasons. You know, if I look at the Middle East, for example, I see the civil war in Algeria. It has nothing to do with Israel. Sudan, it has nothing to do with Israel. Iraq, it has nothing to do with Israel. Crazy dictator take over a country. I see the problems in Afghanistan, in Indonesia. It has nothing to do with us. So, I mean, the world, I believe so, came to the conclusion that terrorism is a result of a failure in the governmental system, not a result of a just cause. And, by the way, to be, again, fair, it's only the people themselves who can correct it. Nobody can impose a solution. But uh, we see Iran. <coughs> Iran is a country that has two governments. They have the Ayatollahs governing behind the screen, making all the decisions, holding the armies, holding the money. They give orders. They are not accountable to anybody. And you have the formal government elected by Khatami. And again, the most unusual story is that Khatami was elected sincerely. The voters of Khatami meant it earnestly, meant it seriously. You know, th maybe the greatest achievement in my judgment in the 20th century was the liberation of women. Women historically were discriminated submitted to the whims of men, of rulers, of clergymen. Khatami was elected by women who wanted to be liberated, who wanted to be right. But the Ayatollahs, they don't give a damn about them. As we saw the, uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan, you know, the first to be liberated in Afghanistan were again the women. So I don't uh, see any way. It has nothing to do with Israel. It has to do with the choice. Either you have an elected and free government, and if you want a separation between church and state, or you will be terrorized by crazy people that in the name of justice, they permit killing. We politicians are all the time accused that we are compromisers. Right, we have to compromise, because there are conflicts in life. And if you shall not compromise, a person will kill a person, from the cell of family to the cell of the family of nations. We do it not because we like compromises, but because we respect life. But there are religious people in the name of justice who permit killing and shooting without any discrimination. And they are the danger. Not all religions, but the ones who are fanatic and call for killing and death. Mr. Karebi from Netherlands. Monsieur, Monsieur le Ministre, vous êtes un homme de paix. Minister, you're a man of peace, you're a man of courage. And you're a man of hope. Your speech was an impressive one. And it was very reflective. It made me think of our Dutch philosopher Spinoza, who said we must not uh, criticize, we must understand. Now, I'd like to understand the mechanisms which produce and reproduce violence in the Middle East, and how to create a new area of uh, Jewish-Arab understanding. And perhaps uh, one way would be for Israel to become a member of the Arab League. Uh, are we to take it that, that you are speaking on behalf of the Arab League and offering Israel <laughs> an invitation? <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm a Dutchman, says Mr. Schaeve. We have no problem with Holland, says Mr. Perez. From Russia. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Слушаю, господин Перес, ваше выступление и ответы на вопросы, хотя я очень сожалею, что мы не можем слушать здесь в парламентской ассамблее палестинскую сторону. Попытайтесь ответить мой вопрос несколько устремлен в будущее. В случае реальных консультаций по созданию независимого палестинского государства, каких гарантий безопасности от теракта смог бы потребовать Израиль от палестинской стороны? Спасибо. Well, uh, the government of Israel did not take a decision about the creation of a Palestinian state for the simple reason that you have to take decisions in accordance with a certain cal calendar, with a certain logic. I, for one, I'm clearly for a Palestinian state. I believe that uh, most of the Israelis are of the same view. We don't end let me say, in a very serious manner, late Prime Minister Rabin and myself went to Oslo because we didn't want to dominate the Palestinian life. It is against our moral position as Jewish people. Never in our history did the Jewish people dominate another people. We think it's wrong, it's a mistake. And our driving force was basically spiritual and moral, more than strategic. And that is an unchanging situation. We are not willing or ready to dominate other people. We think it may corrupt our very basic standing as a Jewish people. So that is unchanged. And I believe that a solution is possible. You know, like in Europe, Europe was for hundreds of years in war and bloodshed. I saw Mr. Solzhenitsyn, he told me that in, he thought that the leadership of Europe should have decided, they declared bankruptcy after two world wars and 50 million people being killed and the Holocaust. But Europe, you see, in a short while, contrary to all its history, found a solution not by changing borders, but by changing relations. Europe has shown that the political conflict can be solved more in the economic domain than in the political domain. Jean Monnet contributed to the future of Europe more than many marshals and generals contributed to her past. And my hope that is that the same will happen in the Middle East. There is an economic potential not only a territorial one, to solve the problems. Today, if you have enough educated people, you can maintain an excellent economy. Uh, the advantage of Israel is we have the largest population of scientists and engineers per kilometer, but we don't have much kilometers, you know, so it's not such a big story. But everybody can do it. I'm coming now from India, in India, they are producing now 300,000 engineers per annum. And India will move ahead. The same land, the same tradition, but they, this is switch in it. The, in the Palestinians have nine universities with 60,000 students. I believe this is a good beginning. It is there where peace may start. One will be Mrs. Durier from France. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, President. Monsieur le Ministre, au centre de la pensée de Shimon Peres, il y avait la paix par la coopération régionale. Aujourd'hui, vous êtes enfermé. Vous êtes laissé enfermé, j'ai envie de vous demander, jusqu'à quand, dans une logique inverse, celle de Sharon, logique d'exclusion. Et de guerre. Alors, où est l'espoir Où serait l'espoir pour Israël, même de continuer à exister J'admets que ce n'est pas commode pour moi, mais permettez-moi de dire que ce n'est pas commode aussi pour M. Sharon. Ce n'est pas seulement une simple proposition. 
Je n'avais pas changé mon avis. La solution pour être, à mon avis, régionale, économique, dans une époque qui est complètement différente que le passé. Pour cela, il faut survoler. Le plus grand problème, c'est la terreur. Et à mon avis, il y a un espoir pour terminer les, les terreurs parce que les victimes de, terreur, de terrorisme ne sont pas seulement les Israéliens, mais aussi les Palestiniens. C'est pour cela que nous continuons, continuons notre dialogue parce que l'Europe, pour nous, c'est un modèle, c'est un exemple où le conflit historique qui durait pendant une génération après génération, était finalement résolu en face d'une chance qui est complètement nouveau et existe pour tout le monde. Thank you. We must now conclude the questions. On behalf of the Assembly, I thank Mr. Perez most warmly for his statement and for the answers he has given to the questions. Mr. Perez, all the best to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dear friends, I want to confirm that tomorrow at 3 p.m., Mr. Saib Eric Hutt, Minister of Local Government of the Palestinian Authorities, will speak. I propose that the Assembly hold its next public sitting this afternoon at 3 p.m. with the orders of the day which were approved on Monday and, the, and finaling the previous point. Is that agreed? Yes, this is a